Jean Carmen, born on May of 1918 in Maslow, Ohio. At the start of the war, Jean had a small family and had a strong passion to serve his country in any way possible, so he volunteered in the army. He served in World War II as a navigator and a bombardier, a crew member responsible for targeting and releasing bombs from a B-25 aircraft. This was a twin-engine, twin-tail, medium American bomber plane used extensively by Allied forces during the war. A total of 9,816 B-25s were built exclusively for the United States Army Air Corps. Bombing crews had to complete a total of 25 missions before being allowed to go home. Gene flew 30. My mother was driving a car on a winter evening coming home from Dayton, Ohio to Maslin, Ohio, where I was living. And we rounded a curve that was on a hill and it was icy, and the car rolled over. And that was, it rolled three times. Now, in today's car, the car would have been totally demolished. We righted our car and drove away. <laughs> that was adrenaline-filled. Was it? As a, as a child. I didn't get recruited. I volunteered. volunteered. I was married, had a family, would not have had to go. But they, I was working with Chevrolet Motor Division in Flint, Michigan at the time. And my job, what I was doing was placing orders with manufacturers and following them into completion. And then the military needed that kind of expertise. And I volunteered to help the, the uh, war cause. But and they, they ignored all I volunteered for and put me where they wanted to put me. And I, I wound up in the regular army. That wasn't exactly what I had in mind. I was a bombardier. And uh, I was a member of the B-25 crew, which was a medium bomber. There were six members in our crew. The pilot, the co-pilot, and me, and the enlisted men were a radio, a radio gunner, engineer gunner, and tail gunner. And uh, I really had had training all over the United States. And uh, anywhere from Miami, Florida, I was at the uh, University of Miami at Miami, Florida had a navigation program and meteorology program. And uh, we, I completed that and went, and they, they took about 12 of us out of the graduating class and shipped us to bombardier school. We had thought we were gonna be navigators. And they shipped us to bombardier school. And we were in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, McCarran Field, and uh, several different places around the United States. What were your thoughts during this training time or when you learned? Enough, the future was going to take care of itself and I, all we had to do was prepare what we were uh, going through, the studies and what have been making sure that we had everything down pat. And uh, quite honestly, the future was out there but it was going to take care of itself. We, we, didn't have much control over what we were going to do. We were assigned as a as a crew. We first met the the um, all of the members of what would be our crew. We had not met before, and we might have had just casual brushes during training or something as far, but we hadn't met as a crew, and we were assigned in Greenville, South Carolina. And we got to know each other quite well. We flew a lot of, of uh, training missions together so that we could uh, pretty well determine what each of us was going to do and how we were going to react to different situations. And uh, there were several incidents. I'm not quite sure if this is the kind of thing you want to hear, but I want to tell you anyhow. Our bombardier, not our bombardier, our... Uh, waste gunner 
was a young Jewish boy named Bernie Plotkin. Before we went overseas, we went into a post exchange, and a young lady that uh, was serving us had on a sweater, and on, on one side of the sweater on the front was the name Betty. And Bernie said to her, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? She said, no. He said, what do you call the other one? <laughs> she had... Her, her breasts were, according to Bernie, were named. <laughs> and so he wanted to know what, what she called the other one. <laughs> but... Uh, You ask about flights and what have you, and, and there, are, there are so many. We had so much flying time that it would be difficult to pick out any one. When we went overseas, when we picked up our plane and were ready to go, we had, we had gone through hours and, and hours of endless training and bombing runs and, and all kinds of different kinds of missions. We flew into Corsica and had a real good landing in the whole bit and no no problems of any kind, just really nice. And then we were introduced to all around to the various people we'd be flying with. And I was on my 30th mission and we were headed for the bridges at the railroad yard, not the bridges, the railroad yard, the marshalling yards at um, Avignon, France. And uh, we were after the marshalling yards there, and we had been briefed that the um, anti-aircraft fire was not anything spectacular. It was There was some there, but not much. Well, as it turned out, there was a lot there. Our briefing was... Uh, a little bit short of what was really true. And when we hit Avignon, I had uh, settled in on my bomb site and we were all set to go and we bombs were away. And I was watching the bombs fall. I always wanted to see where they hit. <laughs> and when I was watching them fall, when I, I heard a loud bang, real loud bang. Now in, uh, in a plane, if the shrapnel and the bomb bursts are away from you, you hear cracks and pops. But if you hear a loud bang, it's pretty close to you. Well, I heard the bang and felt the shudder, and we were hit. And they took off uh, the right... Our, and the B-25 is a twin-tail airplane, and it has twin, twin rudders. And it took off the right rudder, and the, the port engine, the right engine, was shot out, and we were going down. There was no question about it. And um, Joe Maywald came on, the pilot, and he was, so when, the, when the shells hit, they took out our hydraulic system, so he had no help in flying that airplane at all. It was all manual control. If, if you're familiar with uh, Europe at all, the farmers pick up the rocks in their field and they'll build fences and walls throughout the fences, uh, throughout the uh, fields. And we were about to run into one of those walls and Joe came in with his airplane and he leveled, was able to level it off and hit the tail on one side of the fence and we bounced over that wall and skidded to a landing. We're in France. And that's enemy territory. So we know when we land that we're surrounded by Germans. And they're, they're going to find us. Well, it was kind of interesting in a way. Um, I always tell this story. One of the hardest things I ever had to do was to shoot my bomb site. We were instructed that if anything happened to us that you destroy the, the site and destroy anything in the airplane that it could be of help to the to the uh, enemy. And uh, shooting that bomb site was something I just really didn't want to do. Incidentally, this is a this is a model of the of the uh, Norden bomb site which is at its time this was one of the high, most highly guarded secrets in the army. 
we destroyed all the stuff in the airplane that we could, and we were looking around for them. We expected to find a German bear behind every blade of grass. We thought there would be somebody there. So we were hiding in the, in the field, and one at a time, we get up and run across that road and, and that trail and into the trees. And uh, I had uh, one of the pieces of plaque that hit me glanced off a ring on this finger and lodged in my little finger. The piece of flak lodged in the little finger. And uh, my finger was, the, it had uh, collapsed the ring and my finger was turning black and the circulation was shot. And uh, one of the things that we were given was an escape kit. And in that escape kit, it's not really a whole lot bigger than, than your uh, uh, cell phone. It's about three quarters of an inch high and uh, maybe two and a half by five inches long. And in that escape kit, there was a map on silk of the area that we were in. There was um, a short piece of steel with um, a serrated edge that could use it. it could be used as a saw. And Joe was using that to cut the ring off my finger. And uh, that took a little while. <laughs> And we were just still expecting the Germans to pop up just any moment to capture us, and uh, we were anticipating. Well, after a short time, I was um, losing a little blood, and I said, I'm, I'm going to try to find some help. And so I started to take off, and Joe Maywald, the pilot, said, not alone, you're not. He would not let me go alone. He just absolutely refused. So we told everybody to stay put, and if we found anything, we'd be back. And then uh, just over a little, just a little rise, we saw another house. And there was a, a man and three women living in that house, and they were part of the French Maquis, the French underground. And um, they took us in immediately, and they doctored my wounds, and, and uh, in that escape kit, there was painkiller and all kinds of stuff. And um, they fed us and uh, told us that, that uh, we couldn't stay there because there was danger of the Germans catching them. If they caught them with us, they were going to be executed probably. So they told us where to go to meet the French Maquis, that there would be French Maquis there. We thought we had nailed down the position, but we missed it. And uh, very early the next morning, it was just just shortly after daybreak, we heard um, noises off in, the, in just a short distance away from us. And uh, Joe and I crawled out to see what was going on. There were, we, we came to a log with some brush growing up around it and it gave us good cover and we stood there laid behind that log and raised up it was kind of funny. We were, we were expecting Germans at any moment expected them to be there. We raised up to see the Germans and it turned out to be one lone Frenchman, an elderly gentleman. And uh, we watched him for a while and, and realized that he was alone. So I stood up and called to him. And he was like the little old lady. He started to shake. <laughs> and he was absolutely scared to death. Well, I was uh, able to converse with him. I, my, my French I hadn't used in school. And it was uh, coming back to me rather quickly, I thought. And it was fortunate, but it, was, it just turned out to be really a good choice when I was in school and had, had no thought that that would happen. Many times the Lord had played a significant part in my life, and that was one of them. But he said he convinced us to stay put and that he would have help come. And the next day we, we uh, get up again early in the morning, and the guys that had, the Frenchmen that had picked us up had been to the site of our crash, 
and had taken from it all the things that they could carry away from the airplane, including the bomb site and a machine gun. They took a, the machine gun out of the nose of the plane and they had it on the back of a flatbed truck along with the uh, uh, escape raft, which was a big yellow raft, and they had inflated that thing. Now, we're trying to stay inconspicuous, <laughs> and they've got a, a yellow raft that they want us to sit on in the back of the truck. So we sit on that raft in the back of the truck, and they take us to another place, and um, that was a farmhouse that had a, a breezeway connected to a, an outbuilding. We spent the night in that breezeway. They had straw piled on the floor and, and uh, very early again. Everything happened early in the morning and it was, you heard way off in the distance, we heard a crack. So I ran to the, the uh, doorway. There was no door in there, just a doorway on the side of this breezeway and looked down the side of the building and way off in the distance, I could see a line of German soldiers and all the machine guns. What they had fired at, I don't know. But they had just uh, enough to wake us up, if, if anything else, I guess. But anyhow, we got out of the, the breezeway and, and ran from the opposite direction. <laughs> we were running like fury, trying to escape the Germans and get away from them. And uh, we got up into the hills with a lot of trees between us, and we heard the Germans coming along below us. And we thought, well, now that's great. They're going to pass us by, and we'll just stay here until morning, and uh, we'll get out of here now. Where we were going to go or what we were going to do, I had no idea. But we just that was just irrational thought at that time. And uh, we felt sure that the, the Germans had uh, passed us by when they outsmarted us. When they got down beyond us, well beyond us, they spread out from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill and started beating the brush coming back. Well, the closer they got to us, the, the more nervous we got. At one point, my heart was actually, I felt it like it was beating me off. I could, they could hear it. I could hear my heart. It was just pounding. And uh, I, I felt at one point that it was raising us off the ground, the, the pulsing and that 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 movement was going to attract the Germans. Well, Ed, we, we had split up and were lying in the, in the underbrush. And Ed Weaver, the co-pilot, was on my left, and Joe was on my right, and the, uh, the other three uh, uh, crew members were behind us. And uh, Ed, at one point, jumped up, and he had his hands up, and he said, we're Americans. Well, right in front of us, not, not 20 feet away, was this line of soldiers with their rifles pointed. And uh, when Ed got up, I got up. And the German looking at me said, uh, American? And I said in my best imitated French, we oui. uh, knew some American. And uh, he said, the German soldier, said, Viva America, long live America, long live America. The German soldier, well, that relaxed us. There are a whole lot of things went on before this happened, but in the distance on one morning, we, they had tried on two different occasions to move us from this little fortress in the city of Dinia, and it was, um, there was a wall that must have been 10 to 12 feet high that ran around all this area where we were kept prisoners. And uh, off in the distance, we could hear the rumble of heavy artillery. And at one point, after they had turned us back from this second trip, um, we heard a rather loud crack of artillery fire, which told us that the uh, Americans were moving in. And uh, the German commander of the camp, a captain, came to me. He said to me in French, I will not surrender to the French 
nor to the British, and certainly not to the Maquis, but he said, I would surrender to you. The American captain agreed this was fine, but we um, accepted his surrender and, and the, uh, we turned him over to this captain of the, of the uh, infantry and then uh, proceeded to, to uh, wait for transportation back to the southern coast of France when they would take us back <coughs> to Corsica. Uh, we knew that um, we were being victorious as far as the Germans were concerned. We, weren't, we, we, we felt the same way about the Japanese. We felt that we had them on the run. But we weren't, we weren't sure, of course. Well, the, the Japanese, uh, once the bombs were dropped, that was the end of the Japanese, and that, that, that came after the, the German thing. What's your recollection of that? What? We were aghast. We had no idea. No, nobody knew anything about this. This was uh, absolute secret, and when the bombs dropped, nobody could believe what happened. It was just an impossibility. And to see the pictures that came out after this happened with a whole city wiped out with a single bomb, this was impossible. And the, the B-29 was still uh, quite a new weapon as far as we were concerned. And that was, um, when I saw my first B-17, I thought it was the biggest airplane I'd ever seen. I guess maybe it was. And then I saw it parked next to a B-29, <laughs> and you could have put it in the cockpit. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah, silver. Oh, super. It's huge. What a big airplane.